Welcome to Health Management Information Systems Clinical Decision Support Systems. This is Lecture B. This lecture will identify the challenges and barriers in building and using clinical decision support systems, explain how legal and regulatory technologies may affect their use, and introduce the future directions for clinical decision support systems. The objectives for this lecture, Clinical Decision Support Systems Lecture B, R2, identify the challenges and barriers to building and using clinical decision support systems. Discuss legal and regulatory considerations related to the distribution of clinical decision support systems and describe current initiatives that will impact the future and effectiveness of clinical decision support systems. As a framework for supporting clinical decisions to improve outcomes, the CDS 5 Rights Model State CDS supported improvements in desired healthcare outcomes can be achieved if communication occurs in the following manner. The right information, evidence-based, suitable to guide action, pertinent to the circumstance, to the right person, considering all members of the care team, including clinicians, patients, and their caretakers, in the right CDS intervention format, such as an alert, order set, or reference information to answer a clinical question through the right channel. For example, a clinical information system, CIS, such as an electronic medical record, EMR, personal health record, PHR, or a more general channel, such as the internet or a mobile device. At the right time in workflow, for example, at time of decision, action, need. However, achieving the five rights for CDS is challenging. Berner, 2009, states, Achieving the five rights for CDS presents challenges, and the challenges differ depending on how closely the CDS is tied to what the clinician already intends to do. Clinicians may initially want certain reminders, or after performance assessments, agree that they need other reminders. But in either situation, they are choosing to receive the reminders. The key issue in reminding the user about things they choose to be reminded about is the timing of the reminder. For instance, should reminders for preventative care be given to the physician in advance of the patient visit, for example, the day before, or should the reminders appear during the patient's visit, page 7 to 8. Clinical decision support systems offer so much potential to improve patient care and outcomes. Similar challenges in designing and selecting clinical decision support systems to the five rights model can be posed as questions. Berner asks them in the following manner. Whose decisions are being supported? What information is presented? When is it presented? And how it is presented to the user? Each question should be explored and answered before building or selecting a clinical decision support system. If any are ignored, the chances that end users will use it and the expected system benefits gained are limited. For example, consider the question, when the intervention will be presented. Depending on the information, the best time to deliver could be at the point of care. For example, delivering an alert about drug-to-drug -drug interactions at the time of prescribing. Other information, such as providing the names of patients being seen on a given day who need immunizations, could occur prior to the patient encounter. Knowing when the information from the CDS should be presented automatically or on demand, i.e., when the user chooses to access the information, is no small feat. Tying the answers to the other questions, for example, whose decisions are being supported, can also be complex. Looking further at the challenge of knowing when the information from the CDS should be presented, that is, automatically or on demand, another factor that must be considered and presents its own set of challenges is deciding how much control the user has over the decision to use clinical decision support. In other words, control over whether users are required to accept the CDS suggestion, whether they can easily ignore it, or whether it takes significant effort to override the advice. Berner explains, these decisions involve not only whether the CDS is set up to be displayed on demand, 
so that users have full control over whether they choose to access it, but also the circumstances under which users can, after viewing the CDS information, choose whether to accept it. The two aspects of control are related, and they connect with how closely the CDS advice matches a clinician's intention. CDS may be designed to 1. Remind clinicians of things they intend to do, but should not have to remember. 2. Provide information when clinicians are unsure what to do. 3. Correct errors clinicians have made. Or 4. Recommend that the clinicians change their plans. Conceived of in this way, it should be obvious that the user's reactions to CDS may differ with these diverse intents. Building on to the challenges already described, Table 5.1 summarizes three clinical decision support intents and matches each to a user's intention along with the key issue. The first CDS intent is an automatic intervention, a reminder of actions a user intends to do but should not have to remember. As one would expect, timing is a key issue. Next under CDS intent is an on-demand intervention one that provides information when a user is unsure of what to do or a request for consultation. In this instance, it is speed and ease of access that the user is looking for. According to the users, may recognize the need for information but may be willing to access it only if they can do so efficiently. If access is too difficult or time-consuming, potential users may choose not to use the CDS. The third row lists the CDS intent as correct user's errors and or recommend a user change plans and could be either an automatic or on-demand intervention. For an automatic intervention, the key issues are timing, autonomy, and user control over the response. For an on-demand intervention, they are speed, ease of access, autonomy, and user control over the response. For this CDS intent, users balance the change planned with the desire for autonomy with other demands, such as improving patient safety or decreasing practice costs. Another key issue related to autonomy that was previously discussed is the amount of control users have over how they respond to the CDS. Berner goes on to explain, while some of these issues have been addressed by research, there are no universally accepted guidelines regarding them in part because clinicians often differ in their preferences. In addition, there are varying clinical approaches that are justified, which makes designing effective CDS a challenge. How these issues are addressed will influence the ultimate impact and effectiveness of CDS. The report, Clinical Decision Support Systems, State of the Art, cited several studies and provided insight into other challenges in the building and using of clinical decision support systems. Discussions were split between the impact on care process and patient health outcomes and the impact on structure. For the first one, impact on care process and patient health outcomes, the three challenges identified were matching of clinical decision support to user intentions, user control, disruptiveness, and risk, and integration of CDS into work processes. Each one of these challenges presents issues which need to be addressed when building clinical decision support systems. For example, according to the report, integrating CDS into the workflow often requires unique customization to local processes and sometimes to changes in processes when previous clinical processes were found to be inefficient or ineffective. CDS also needs to be minimally disruptive to the clinician's cognitive workflow and this too can be a challenge. For instance, accessing the data needed for the CDS can be disruptive if the clinical systems are not well integrated or if the necessary data are not in a form that the CDS can use. If the lack of data leads to inappropriate alerts, these alerts may be overridden. In addition to the extent that using CDS or following its advice is disruptive to the clinician's work or thought processes, the CDS is likely to be ignored. Another group of discussion points addressed studies on the structural impact of CDS. The conclusion was, it is important to recognize that the development, 
implementation, and maintenance of CDS will have an impact on the structure or work system in which it will be used. The changes that the CDS will introduce need to be incorporated in the planning so that the impact on clinician time is not excessive. In addition, often IT resources are limited due to implementation of other EHR modules, supportive systems already in place, and compliance demands, which causes barriers to CDS deployment. There are six barriers to the effective implementation of CDS. The first three identified are acquisition and validation of patient data. The issues here are the need to have 1. Effective techniques for capturing data accurately, completely, and efficiently, and 2. A standardized way to express clinical situations that a computer can interpret. Modeling of medical knowledge, described by Mucin as deciding what clinical distinctions and patient data are relevant. Identifying the concepts and relationships among concepts that bear on the decision-making task. And ascertaining a problem-solving strategy that can use the relevant clinical knowledge to reach appropriate conclusions. Elicitation of medical knowledge. Keeping the knowledge base up to date is portrayed by Mucin as an important problem for CDSS. The last three barriers to the effective implementation of CDS are representation of and reasoning about medical knowledge. Moosen stated, among the ongoing research challenges is the need to refine the computational techniques for encoding the wide range of knowledge used in problem solving by medical experts. Another part to this is the need to obtain an understanding of the psychology of human problem solving for use in the development of clinical decision support tools so they more closely reproduce the process by which clinicians move through the diagnostic process. Validation of system performance. Here Mucin pointed out issues of having a responsible party for validating the clinical knowledge bases and the challenges in determining how best to evaluate the performance of the tools that use the knowledge, particularly when a gold standard in which to perform the evaluation doesn't exist. Integration of Decision Support Tools. Mucin state the need for more innovative research on how best to tie knowledge-based computer tools to programs designed to store, manipulate, and retrieve patient-specific information. One legal barrier to the implementation of clinical decision support systems is the lack of detailed case laws on issues for dealing with clinical decision support systems and under which category of law the systems will fall. Mucin provide the following explanation regarding this barrier. Under negligence law, which governs medical malpractice, a product or activity must meet reasonable expectations for safety. The principle of strict liability, on the other hand, states that a product must not be harmful because it is unrealistic to require that decision support systems make correct assessments under all circumstances we do not apply such standards to physicians themselves. The determination of which legal principle to apply will have important implications for the dissemination and acceptance of such tools. Another legal barrier described by Mucin is the issue of who will bear the liability. Should it be the physicians or the builders of the systems? Mucin state, a related question is the potential liability borne by physicians who could have accessed such a program and who chose not to do so and who made an incorrect decision when the system would have suggested the correct one. As with other medical technologies, precedents suggest that physicians will be liable in such circumstances if the use of consultant programs has become the standard of care in the community. With no case law yet to establish the precedent, Recommendations have been for stronger regulation and guidelines. There are also regulatory barriers that could affect distribution of clinical decision support systems. One identified by Mucin is the validation of decision support tools before their release and what role the government should play. Where should the government fall with regards to pre-release regulations of medical software? Mucin point out that programs that make decisions directly controlling the patient's treatment, for example, closed-loop systems that administer insulin, 
or that adjust intravenous infusion rates or respirator settings are viewed as medical devices subject to FDA regulation. However, the IOM report, Health IT and Patient Safety, Building Safer Systems for Better Care, did not recommend the FDA, ONC, CMS, or AHRQ as the regulatory body to oversee health IT safety, but did recommend the creation and funding of a new independent federal agency, similar in structure to the National Transportation Safety Board. Other barriers include data privacy and security. Identifiable data used for research purposes are afforded protections, which is one view of what data used for CDS is. Aggregated data can be used without consent. But de-identification and aggregation of clinical data across systems is difficult. While there are challenges and barriers, including legal and regulatory ones, in the building, use, and distribution of clinical decision support systems, their benefits, such as avoidance of errors and adverse events, are seen as worth the work involved. A description of the various efforts and initiatives are discussed in the next few slides. Legislative and regulatory efforts needed to support widespread adoption of clinical decision support systems were identified by the AHIC CDS work groups. As explained in a letter to Secretary HHS Leavitt, the recommendations were as follows drive measurable progress toward priority performance goals for healthcare quality improvement through effective use of CDS. Explore options to establish or leverage a public-private entity to facilitate collaboration across many CDS development and deployment activities. Accelerate CDS development and adoption through federal government programs and collaborations. One of these recommendations has been implemented, as the next few slides will show. There are a number of projects shaping the future directions for clinical decision support systems. These include the Office of the National Coordinators Initiatives, the Institute of Medicine Studies, and the Meaningful Use Criteria, Objectives, and Measures. Each will be explored in the slides that follow. The Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT, ONC, which is charged with coordinating federal efforts regarding HIT adoption and meaningful use, has stated their commitment and facilitated a number of projects for the purpose of moving CDS development and deployment ahead. The major activities include the Advancing CDS is a project intended to Advance the widespread dissemination of successful CDS implementation practices to promote broad CDS adoption. Improve the acceptance and usability of medication CDS systems through the development of a clinically important drug-drug interaction list. Advance the practical sharing of effective CDS interventions across care settings. Identify CDS-related gaps and goals specific to a broad range of clinical specialties. Another ONC initiative related to CDS includes the report Development of a Roadmap for National Action on Clinical Decision Support that recommended ways to improve CDS development, implementation, and use. Three pillars for fully realizing the promise of CDS were identified. They are 1. Best knowledge available when needed. 2. High adoption and effective use. And 3. Continuous Improvement of Knowledge and CDS Methods Other projects include the development of CDS recommendations by the American Health Information Community, AHIC, work groups mentioned previously, on ONC-sponsored Clinical Decision Support, CDS, Workshop, and the CDS Federal Collaboratory. The final ONC initiative is an Institute of Medicine study carried out under a $989,000 contract awarded in September 2010. The next slide will provide more information on this work. The Institute of Medicine, IOM, has for many years published key bodies of work. A press release on September 29, 2010, included a quote from Dr. David Blumenthal, who, at the time, was National Coordinator for Health Information Technology which explained IOM's role. 
Since 1999, when the IOM published its groundbreaking study, To Air is Human, the Institute has been a leader in the movement to improve patient safety. The To Air is Human report emphasized Mistakes can best be prevented by designing the health system at all levels to make it safer, to make it harder for people to do something wrong and easier for them to do it right. The IOM study launched in 2010 was aimed at examining a comprehensive range of patient safety-related issues, including prevention of HIT-related errors and rapid reporting of any HIT-related patient safety issues. IOM saw its charge as recommending ways to make patient care safer using health IT so that the nation will be in a better position to realize its potential benefits. As mentioned previously, one of the recommendations was the creation and funding of a new independent federal entity that would have the responsibility to oversee health IT safety. Another recommendation was funding a new health IT safety council to set standards for safety. The final endeavor having an impact on future directions for CDSS is the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, or ARRA, and the Associated Health Information Technology for Economic and Clinical Health, High Tech, provision. ARRA, officially Public Law 111-5, signed into law February 2009, provides many different stimulus opportunities, one of which is $19.2 billion for health IT. High tech is a provision of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. The high tech section of ARRA deals with many of the health information communication and technology provisions. It established programs under Medicare and Medicaid to provide incentive payments for the meaningful use of certified EHR technology. According to the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, the Medicare and Medicaid EHR incentive programs will provide incentive payments to eligible professionals, eligible hospitals, and critical access hospitals, CAHs, as they adopt, implement, upgrade, or demonstrate meaningful use of certified EHR technology. Stage 1 of meaningful use required at least one clinical decision support rule while subsequent stages required increasing numbers of CDS rules. In stages two and three, the requirement is that the rules need to be tied to specific quality measures as well. This concludes clinical decision support systems. This lecture described challenges and barriers, including legal and regulatory ones, in the building, use, and distribution of clinical decision support systems. To move forward requires further effort. A number of projects shaping the future directions for clinical decision support systems have come to fruition in the last few years, and more initiatives are underway. These include the ONC initiatives and the meaningful use requirements tied to clinical decision support.